So hello and welcome to this Embarcadero RAD Studio XE4 technical online event focusing on iOS development. My name is Al Manorino and I'm one of the Embarcadero systems engineers. Also joining us on this webinar is David I from the Scotts Valley, California office. And he is here to help show features and answer questions as needed. So just in case you folks can hear me, David and or Anders, who's also joining us, can you say hello just to make sure you can hear me? I can say hello. Uh, David's uh, just setting up his microphone. Hello. <laughs> All right, wonderful. I'm here. Wonderful. So, so I'm, I'm here physically in, in New York. Um, Anders and David I is out in Scotts Valley, California. So we have East Coast and West Coast covered. So now throughout this presentation, uh, feel free to type in questions into the questions box. And then throughout the presentation, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can or at the end during the uh, questions and answers session. So in the time we have together, uh, I plan to show you as much as I can on Delphi XE4 and iOS development. So Embarcadero has been investing in a new compiler architecture that is designed to be common between both Delphi and CBuilder. And additionally, this new architecture allows us to support multiple CPUs. So Rad Studio XE4 is a multi-device true native app development platform for everyone who needs to develop apps for desktops, tablets, and smartphones and get them to market fast. So we're going to see how you can manage one code base, one team, one schedule without sacrificing any performance. And the true native apps that you're going to create, like the one we see here, is going to give you much faster application performance with much more control and tighter security and a much better user experience. So the goal of this presentation are these, are these first three items. So we wanna go over multi-device, true native application development from a single code base for iOS, Windows, and Mac. We want to be able to reduce complexity and cost with just one of everything for your app development. So that means one development team, one code base, one budget, and one schedule. And we want to be fast to market with extendable and reusable visual component building blocks for faster and highly maintainable development. And all of you attendees on this webinar are going to receive a special discount on Rad Studio XE4, Delphi uh, XE4, and or C++ Builder XE4. Okay, now we're going to get into the details on Delphi XE4 for iOS development. So what's new in XE4? So with XE4, we added a mobile pack for iOS, and that lets us create you know, true native iOS apps for the iPhone, the iPad, and the iPod Touch using a full visual designer for the iOS user interfaces with multiple device types, their resolutions, and their orientations, once again, all from the same code base. We also now have FireMonkey uh, version 3. So this is our next generation platform for building multi-device true native apps for iOS, Windows, and Mac using a single code base. So now with Delphi XE4 for iOS development, this is our third generation of development for FireMonkey. So with FireMonkey 3, we now have multimedia, layout management, anchors, touch and gestures, actions, form families, you know, faster and more GPU utilization, uh, native bitmap pixel formats. We have platform, device, and sensor services, and so much more, and we'll, we'll touch upon as much as, as we can during our time together. Also with XE4, we introduced Interbase iOS as an embedded database inside your iOS devices. So now Interbase is now an embeddable database for your iOS devices. So you now have a free feature limited version of Interbase that can be embedded into your iOS device. So the Interbase database can now be included 
in your free and or paid iOS apps and have them accepted into the Apple App Store. With XE4, we also added visual live bindings for iOS. So now with Delphi for iOS, you can use visual live bindings for rapid prototyping and binding controls to database columns and or binding controls to other components such as list boxes and list views and edit and labels, etc. And lastly, we now have FireDAC. So FireDAC is Embarcadero's new multi-device data access library. Uh, FireDAC enables native high-speed direct access from RAD Studio, Delphi, and CBuilder to all the popular databases such as Interbase, SQLite, MySQL, SQL Server, and, and, and all the others that you're familiar with, including DataSnap. So at this point, uh, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to open up Delphi XE4 iOS and, and show you what that looks like. So here we are in Rad Studio XE4. And what's great about this is you can continue to use your same Delphi programming skills and create uh, iOS applications today and then Android apps later, uh, later this year from the same code base. So what we're looking at right now is a, is a U.S. State Capitals Trivia app. And I'm happy to say that this app has already been accepted on the Apple Store. And it also uses an embedded and encrypted interbase database. So for Delphi developers, you already know how to do this. And you can reuse and re-leverage your existing Delphi programming skills to create these, these awesome iOS applications. So this is a, a multi-form uh, application. Uh, it has a, has a main unit, um, which, calls the, which calls the quiz page. It has an, has an answers page, a, a score page, and, a, and an options page. So the main page uh, is going to call this quiz page. And then inside the quiz page is where I set my connection to my interbase database, which is done right here. So here's where I make my connection to my embedded interbase database, and I'm also passing it the, the system encryption password. So again, I'm going to say I'm happy to say that this encrypted embedded interbase database has already passed submission to the, to the Apple App Store. And as we're looking at the code, it's the same Delphi code you're already familiar with. Now here from the project manager, I see that I can deploy this application either to my iOS simulator, and that's included with Delphi, or I can send it to my real iOS device, or I can run it as a 32-bit uh, Windows application. And then from my deployment manager, I see all the files that, that I need to get packaged up for deployment, including my embedded interbase database and, and the license key that I need for it. So now if I want to run this application on my iOS simulator, I'll select iOS simulator and say run. So here we build the application here on Windows. I'm also, I'm also connected to a Mac because we need the Mac to, uh, we need the Mac libraries to, to help us sandbox and make sure I have a developer certificate to this to create the application. And then it's gonna send it over to the, my, my Mac and fire up my iOS simulator, and I now see the application running in my iOS simulator. So between my Windows box, my IDE, it went through this platform assistant server, and it opened up my iOS simulator, and it ran the application here. So here's what it looks like on my iOS simulator. So now if I select my iOS device in debug mode, I'm going to do the same thing. This time it'll send it over to my iOS device, so when I come up here and I say, run this application, it's going to do the same thing. Send it over to my real iOS device. And let me turn that on for you and show you what that looks like. So here's my iPad. And this is what the app looks like running on the iPad. So that's all very cool. 
All right, I'm going to disconnect myself from my iPad, and we are going to continue. And like I said, at any time, feel free to uh, enter questions into the questions box, and then throughout this presentation, we'll be, we'll be happy to answer them for you. All right. So many, many new features were added into XE4. So here's a, uh, here's a list of some of the 34 new features. And as you can see, most of the new features are on FireMonkey and iOS development. Plus, we added uh, uh, features for uh, CBuild or 64-bit compiler fixes and enhancements. Now, in addition to all the great core pieces that are inside of Rad Studio, Delphi, and CBuilder. Uh, Rad Studio also includes these bundled special editions of the many popular third-party tools. So you get all of this additional functionality as part of Rad Studio at no additional cost, and you can visit our Embarcadero website for more information on the feature sets of these special editions. So uh, bundled tools are fast report for reporting, T-chart graphing, and charting the intraweb web application platform uh, beyond compare, file compare, the AQ time performance profiling tool, uh, the Indie in Internet Direct Components, a code site for logging, a Glick FX component library, the entire IP Works Internet Components, and Documentation Insight uh, doc tool for Delphi. And then in addition, we also have the special offer, uh, good until the, the end of this month, June 30, 2013. So in addition, you can also get uh, TMS Cloud Pack components for iOS, uh, the Meta VCL, the FireMonkey Converter, uh, the FireMonkey Premium Style Pack, where you get uh, nice style sheets like this uh, Jet and, and Diamond, and Mac in Cloud, um, cloud-based Mac access. So those of you, for your folks who don't already have a Mac on site and you need to test and simulate your applications, uh, this is a great service uh, that you can use. And part of the agreement between uh, with Embarcadero, you get uh, 30 days free use uh, of this Mac in cloud access to, to test your applications. So Embarcadero, we need to think of Embarcadero now as the multi-device you know, application development solution. So with, with one development team, one code base, you are now going to be able to create uh, the application once, and then you're going to be able to just click and compile it to run on Windows, you know, your Mac, and iOS from the same code base, uh, no extra development effort. Now, Android for Delphi, and C++ Builder for iOS and Android is planned later this year. And by, and by this great framework, you're going to be able to reduce your lines of code that we see up to 80% using Rad Studio's proving visual development solution. And your results are going to be faster time to market for Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android later this year at, at a much lower cost. So the key point I all want you to take away from this is that Delphi is going to create these true native apps. Now there are many vendor tools out there using the term native app development to describe web technologies and scripts wrapped into an app package to deliver an app-like user experience, but this approach means that developers are very limited in both performance and, and capabilities. With the Delphi, you know, Rad Studio, true native capability, what we're doing is we're compiling a discrete binary for Windows, Mac, and iOS. So this is going to make your app uh, very fast, very secure, and it's going to deliver a, a standard user experience that users expect from a, from a multi-touch experience. So the, the apps that you're going to create with, with Delphi and, and CBuilder they are going to be script free and they're going to run directly on the hardware CPU giving you the advantages of, uh, of being very fast, very secure and a, and a much better user experience. You know, one of the common questions we still get asked like is, you know, does, does Delphi still cross compile the Delphi code to Objective C and then build the iOS app using Xcode on the map? Uh, on the Mac, and, and the answer is no. Now with Delphi, 
we have native code optimizing Delphi compilers for Win32, Win64, Mac OS X, uh, the iOS Intel simulator, the iOS ARM device. So now inside of Delphi, there's five compilers integrated the IDE, and they're also available as, as command line compilers. Now some of the other products out there like, like Kony, Adobe, Censure, Kendo, and even our own HTML5 builder, uh, they're using scripting language, you know, XML and, and CSS and, and JavaScript to create an application that looks and feels like a native iOS application or an Android application, but it has really none of the benefits of a true native uh, binary level uh, you know, compile. So th those types of products uh, they're going to use PhoneGap to, to package up the application, but they're still using JavaScript, HTML5, cascading style sheets to create these web applications, but it's really not a, a true native app. And then other products are using virtual machines like, like Xamarin and, and Mono. They're using virtual machine technology uh, to serve the applications to, to multiple devices. But with, so the, the advantage now with with the, with the Delphi compiler is we're using uh, Delphi and C Builder on the front end to, to parse your Delphi and, and C Builder code and then we're sending it into our uh, common uh, intermediate representation that's our LLVM and then from there we can either use our Intel based compiler or our ARM compiler to generate the true, the true native apps we need going forward so that, that's very exciting. Now, as far as demonstrations, for the rest of this uh, webinar, uh, I plan to show you as much of this functionality as possible that we have time for. So I'm going to walk you through, you know, the, the whole setup. You know, how do how do I set up my environment to test my Delphi for iOS application on both the iOS simula simulator and the iOS device? You know, how do I go about creating my first FireMonkey iOS application? Uh, how do I use the uh, the user interface elements like the buttons and the calendar and the combo boxes? Uh, how do I do rapid prototyping using visual live bindings and the new uh, prototype bind source component? For web services, I'll walk you through how to consume web services from your iOS device. Uh, we'll take a look at all of the device functionality in terms of iOS sensors and services. You know, how do you take and share a picture in an iOS application? How do you use the location sensor on an iOS device? How do you use the notification sen center on an on a iOS device? And then for accessing databases, you know, how do I use my embedded interbase and or my SQLite database inside an iOS application. And let's say I have a backend Microsoft SQL Server database or a DB2 database, you know, how do I connect my iOS application to, so, to some backend remote databases? In that case, uh, we can use our great DataSnap technology to connect an enterprise data snap, create an enterprise database using DataSnap from an iOS, an iOS client. So let's first look at the setup. So as we're looking at the setup, so as you saw before, uh, when I was inside Delphi, Delphi is still a native Windows uh, application. So the Delphi for iOS is, is a native Delphi compiler. And you still need a Mac to be able to package and sign the iOS app on, on the Mac, on the Mac. Now on the, on the Mac side, we have this uh, platform assistant server, and that's included, that, that's included with Delphi. So from Windows, we come to this um, platform assistant server, and this, going to, and this is going to use the Xcode tools to copy the binaries and, and, sign, and sign the package. So a common question we still get asked is, you know, why do I need a Mac and Xcode to be able to build these iOS device applications? Well, the answer is to build, you know, Mac OS X and iOS apps, we still need to leverage the, the Apple header files, the libraries, and the debugging information, and that's only available on a Mac. So we also need to use a couple of the Apple command line tools uh, that are part of Xcode to sandbox and code sign the application for deployment 
uh, from our Windows IDE to your iOS device and to the Apple iOS App Store. So all you need is your one XE4 IDE using our one workflow, our one designer. So that's all you need. And you don't have to worry about multiple IDEs. You don't have to do any project conversions. So all we need to do is you know, install this platform assist int on your Mac, connect your iOS device to the Mac, and let the Delphi IDE on Windows uh, do all the, all the magic for you. So just in case you currently don't have access to a Mac, uh, no Mac, no problem. There's this great service offered by Mac and Cloud that offers rental time of, of, Mark, of Mac hardware on online. Now, if you actually want to deploy your application to an iOS device, so you want to actually deploy it out to the Apple Store, you, you will need to get an Apple developer account and pay for an, uh, an Apple developer certificate, and you will need to provision your, your device uh, to be able to do that. Now, to help you build these uh, mobile applications, to help you get started, now we have these eight great templates for the most popular types of iOS apps being created, you know, such as a, a header footer application, a tabbed application, a, a phone master detail application. So at this point, let's take a look at creating a new FireMonkey application and how do we go about the building it and deploying it to both an, an iOS simulator and an iOS device. So I'm back in Delphi again. So we'll see now in we'll see now in Delphi we have a file a new a Fire Monkey mobile application. And here's our templates with the with the eight templates. So for this application I'm going to create a, a header footer type of application. I need to put this into a new uh, folder. So we see by default we have a uh, we have an iPhone form factor here. Uh, by default, I'm set to an iPhone. I can create this as an iPhone five. I can create this as an iPad application. I can rotate horizontal and and vertical. So in this case, I'm going to make this a iPhone application. Uh, by default, we have a we have a header on the top and a and a footer on the bottom. That's a toolbar. Inside of the toolbar on the top, we have a title. I'm going to change the property of the title instead of name of title. I'm going to call this my app. Now, on this app, I'm going to drop a, a few controls, like a button. So as I'm doing this, you know, the same way you're, you would be developing a VCL app or a FireMonkey app is the same way we're developing this uh, FireMonkey iOS application. I'm going to drop a, a calendar edit component on here. And I'm also going to drop a label. So the same type of event handlers you have on your VCL and FireMonkey applications are the same we have here. So for this button, I can change its, uh, its text to say click me. It's got the same type of event handlers. So for this, for, so it's on for its button click event, I'm going to give it a show message. I'll say hello, Delphi iOS. So again, the same way we're doing it for a VCL application is the same way we're doing it here for iOS. So we all know that show message is a Windows API. When we send this to, over to iOS, we'll convert this to the iOS native uh, pop-up menu. And that's also pretty cool. So back to our designer for our calendar edit, uh, its event handler is a, an on change. So if I change the calendar, it will fire this event on change. And when we fire this event, uh, whatever date we pick, I want to set that as the text 
in my label. So again, as I'm doing this, once again, the same uh, Delphi skills you already know is the same thing we're doing here. So I'm going to format its date and time. And I'm going to make this month, 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 day, day, uh, month, 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 uh, day, day, and year, 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 year. And I'm going to take the calendar, edit one, take its date, and that'll do that for me. Okay, label one dot text. Label one should have a text. Label L A B L label one dot text. Okay. Format date and time looks good to me. So now if I save this. Let me save this project as, let me give it a new location. Uh, let's call it my, I'll call it my iOS app, uh, app 25. So now when I say I want to send this out to my iOS simulator, if I run and run, So again, it builds it here locally, then it sends it over to my platform assist to package up, sign it, and then it'll open it up in my iOS simulator and runs it here for me. So when I click this, uh, the show message on Windows becomes an iOS pop-up menu, and that's cool, and the calendar edit box becomes a true native iOS component. And that's also very cool. And the label does what it's supposed to do. So that's all very cool. So that's the application running on my iOS simulator. Now if I take the same application and send it over to my iOS device, we'll do exactly the same thing. So I have an, I have an iPad 3 USB connected to my MacBook Pro. The device is already provisioned, so again, it's going to build it here in Windows, send it over to my Mac through my platform assistant server uh, using the Xcode tools. And at this point, let me turn on my Mac. So it's building here. It'll send it over to my Mac, uh, send it to my actual device fires up with my default splash screen and, and there's the app running on my Mac with the same behavior with all the native iOS controls. So that's also very cool. All right, let me disconnect myself. All right, so that's cool. So we, we saw how we can create a FireMonkey iOS application, dragging and dropping components on, onto the form, deploy it to both my iOS simulator and my iOS device. Now, if I want the same application to be multi-device, you know, Win32, Win64, Mac OS X, you know, I, I can do it this way. So I can go up to my project group. I can add a, add a new project. I'm going to add a FireMonkey desktop application. So I don't need the default file that it creates for me. I'm going to remove that from the project. And all I need to do is take, take the file that was created in my iOS application and bring it to my project, a FireMonkey project. So now because it's a FireMonkey application, uh, I have a I have a Win32 based application. I can make it a 64-bit application. 
and a Mac OS X application. Now back on the iOS side, uh, because the IDE is still Win32 bit, I'm also able to add a Win32 bit application uh, to the iOS application also. So now if I want to take the same application and create a standalone Mac OS X executable, I'll simply highlight Mac OS X and run it. Once again it builds it here, uh, sends it over to my platform assistant server and then uh, creates the standalone Mac executable and it, it'll run this on, on my Mac for me. So this is, the, this is the application running as a standalone Mac executable. We see on the Mac we take care of the, of the heading for us. So a, a click me show message on the Mac looks like this and a calendar edit on the Mac looks like this. And if I want to run it as a 32-bit application, This is what the app looks like as a 32-bit application. So there's our show message and here's my calendar edit. So that's all pretty cool. So that's the same source code running as a Win32, Win64, Mac OS X, iOS simulator and iOS device application. So that's all, all very cool. So the goal is, you know, once we introduce Android to this from the same code base, I should be able to say right click and say I want to add platform and add Android to this also. So from the same code base we'll have Win32, Win64, Mac OS X, iOS and Android uh, from this one same code base. So that's all very, very cool. Alright, let's continue. Uh, so we just saw how using the, the target platform uh, we can deploy to both the iOS simulator and or my iOS device. Now you can, your, your apps, now when we create these apps, these apps deploy with both the, the retina and the non-retina library. So depending on what device it gets deployed to, if it's retina, we're going to use the retina libraries. Now Apple provides three types of deployments to the iOS devices. You have debug mode and that's what I've been doing all along. There's also an ad hoc mode and an app store mode. Now all of these three are, are fully documented in our documentation. So for the debug mode, it, it, you can debug and deploy to an uh, iOS device that's provisioned and USB connected to your device. Uh, ad hoc deployment means you can distribute the application inside of your own uh, company with, with an enterprise license. So you do not have to submit it to the app store for distribution with an ad hoc certificate. You can host the application inside your own company and have your own users connect to uh, your own service to get the app. And then the, the actual app store that allows you to, to deploy the app directly to the app store. And once again, uh, these are all documented uh, on our site, clearly defining how we do this. Uh, defining the application settings. So you can define your application settings and device support from, from project options and uh, applications. So for a mobile application, the application page provides these three tabs. You have an iPhone tab, iPad and uh, orientation. So for the iPhone and the iPad, uh, Rad Studio provides these, these file icons that you can use as default FireMonkey iOS uh, uh, for applications. So those are all the flames uh, that you see when we uh, submit the default applications. So in this case, uh, this is the uh, icons I use for that US State Capitals Trivia app and that's why uh, we get these great uh, splash screens and icons when I uh, submitted that app. Also on this page is an orientation tab. So for the orientation tab you would you would check you would check this checkbox so you can limit or specify the orientation that your iOS app supports. So for example, if I always wanted my iOS app to be displayed in portrait or orientation, I would have said uh, custom orientation and I would have selected uh, uh, portrait. So these, uh, these iOS devices support rotation of the form in, in all of these following directions. So you know, the iPad I can rotate in all directions, the iPhone and the iPad touch, it rotates in all directions except upside down. So with this custom orientation, if it's not checked, then the orientation of your app 
responds to the default rotations according to the iOS device. So I can either go portrait, uh, upside down, uh, landscape home right, or in this case I selected landscape home left, and that means the iOS app displays in a horizontal landscape orientation with the device's home button uh, on the left. All right, native iOS controls and support. Uh, so Delphi for iOS supports native iOS controls like, like the combo box, the date picker, uh, pop-up menus, and, and, and many more. So let's take a look at some of the uh, iOS controls that are available to us. So for iOS controls, uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, standard controls that we ship with uh, out of the box. And let me send this to my uh, simulator. So as it's building here, uh, these are all the standard uh, iOS controls that we ship with as far as toolbars and, and tool buttons and, and editors and, and list boxes. So these are all standard components you have available to you. So as far as toolbars, you know, you'll, you'll drop a toolbar onto the form and then on that toolbar you can drop, uh, you can drop buttons and, and, and speed buttons and then these buttons have all the different style sheets that are available on an iOS device, right? The back button, uh, delete buttons, done buttons, um, labels, uh, up buttons, down buttons are all available all the different types of tool buttons. So all these particular types of tool buttons that you see on these iOS devices that we, we have available for you. Uh, when, you create the, when you create the tabs, all of the uh, icons on the tabs we, we provide for you or you can create your own custom icon uh, on these tabs for both retina and, and, and non-retina displays. Uh, for list boxes, all the different great types of list boxes we can create with, with all the accessories that you can at attach onto it are, are all available. Um, you know, switch buttons on, on list box items, so all, all of this is available. All the different types of controls, segmented buttons, instead of doing a, um, you know, radio buttons and radio groups, uh, you can have segmented uh, speed buttons that look like this, switches and labels and, and annotations. All, all available and all the, all the great editors and all the uh, virtual editors you can use for, for edit boxes and, and memo boxes, so all, all that's available in, inside the IDE. Some other types of iOS controls we can do, let me show you just a quick couple more. Uh, let's take a look at uh, this is my version of a uh, the Urban Spoon app. So you're in a you're in a new city and you're looking for a restaurant. You want to find a new new restaurant in the area. So in this case, it's the same uh, calendar edit box we saw already. Uh, I dropped an image on here. I got two tabs: uh, one to pick my favorite uh, restaurant picker and another one for the for the favorite restaurants I see. I dropped three uh, combo boxes on here, and I can either I uh, select the combo box and I could add add items this way or I can programmatically add them to the uh, to the to the uh, to the application. So let me send this to my simulator and we'll see what this looks like. So the same process, you know, we got the we got the toolbar on the top with a with a title, which is usually what a toolbar is looked uh, used for to to give you a title on the box what it does. So it deploys to my iOS simulator. I have my combo box. So here we got the true native iOS combo box. So let's say I'm going to be in Florida. Let's say the type of food I'm looking for will be barbecue. And let's say I need a, a two-star, two-star restaurant. And I want to make a reservation. So that works all, all exactly the same way. We'll take one more look at, uh, at iOS controls. Now all of these uh, apps that I'm showing you are, are available inside of the samples that we ship with. So all of these you can see for yourself, uh, for like for virtual keyboards. 
in this case for the virtual keyboard, I'm sending it out to an iPad. So I'm going to my iOS simulator, but I'm sending it to an iPad. And just to help it on my simulator, I'm going to say, I want this device to be an iPad. And it'll rotate it for me. So while it's rotating over here, you'll see, so we have, so on this application, I, uh, I dropped a list box. And then inside the list box, I have uh, edit boxes. And these edit boxes have a property called keyboard type. So like you see on these iOS devices, we have uh, virtual keyboards for URL, uh, phone pad, numbers and punctuation, numbers pad, name, phone pad, and, and email. So for example, on, the, on this app for the web page, I set its edit box its virtual keyboard to be the virtual keyboard for, for URL. So you'll get specific uh, keyboards uh, based on what, what type of data you want to enter into that, uh, into that control. So if I run this on my simulator, we'll see what that looks like. So same process, build it here on Windows, send it over to Platform Assistant, and deploy it to my iOS simulator, and I can do the same thing on my iOS device also. Here's my iOS simulator pops up. So we'll take a look at web page. So for this edit box, so here we have a, 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 a the virtual keyboard for a web app. And then for like a phone, we get the phone pad uh, that pops up. So all that's possible. Uh, let's see, for hardware, I'm going to send this back to my iPhone. All right, so that was a quick look at uh, iOS controls and, and, and what we can support. I'm going to do a quick check on time, see how I'm doing. Oh, we're still doing fine. All right, web services. So the good news is for web services, uh, Delphi for iOS supports all of the Delphi web service technologies that you're, you're already you're already using. So that includes SOAP clients, REST clients uh, using the Indie HTTP component, cloud clients, XML processing uh, using the, the, the ADOM, uh, the WSDL importer, and the HTTP remote interface object. So let's take a look at some uh, web services examples. So the first one I want to look at, uh, this is my Delphi feeds application. And on this application, uh, I dropped the list box. I have an Indie HTTP component, which is a great component to get out to the internet and, uh, and grab a website. And I also have a, an XML document component. So what I want to do here is go to a website that's going to give me an XML page. And I want to load that XML page into my XML document. I want to parse the XML document. And I want to pull out information off of that document and display it on my list box. And I want to go in. So when I click on my uh, update feed button, we're going to our very own uh, feeds, Delphi feeds site which is this, and if I open this up in a web page, we'll see what it looks like. So we'll take a look at the latest feeds that are going on right now as we speak. So we want this application to uh, go out to the internet, go to this site. So we have a nice blog from our chief scientist, Alan Bauer, on automatic reference counting, and so these are the latest uh, Delphi feeds out there. And if we look at this page as a as its page source. So we want to we want to get to this page and we want to pull off of this page things like the you know the title, you know, the the published date, the the author, the description. So we can parse this by looking for the uh, the root node like the channel node and once we find the channel node then we can search for title and published date, author description, get that information and display it into a uh, into a list box. That's what we want to do. So what we're going to do here using the HTTP component. We're going to use uh, Indie HTTP and we're going to go out to that feeds account. We're going to take that XML file, load it into XML document, 
set it to be true. And then we're going to parse that XML document, looking for that root node of channel. And then once we find it, we're going to pull off its title, its author, and its uh, uh, pub publication date. Then since we have that to our list box, we're going to set the text item in our list box to be its title. And we're going to send the detail of our list box to be the author. And that's what this is going to do. So let me send this out to my Iowa simulator. So same process, uh, build it here, send it over to Platform Assist, and deploy it to my iOS simulator, and we could do the same thing for the, uh, the iOS device also. So once it gets out there, we'll click on the Update Feed button. It'll go out to the Delphi Feeds website, parse the XML document, and, uh, and return the results to my, to my list box. So Update Feeds, go out to the internet, that was pretty quick. And there's Alan's blogs on uh, an RC, R, ARC in Delphi. So that works really great. Uh, some other web services I created, like uh, Currency Exchanges goes out to uh, Google's Exchange API. Uh, say, what, what is 100 USDs to BRL worth today? Let's find out. It's worth that. That's great. And a third web service I did out there that uses the uh, uh, WSDL importer was my WSDL calculator, and I'll show you all of these too. So let's say I want to add two numbers up, 11 and 24. Click this plus, goes out to the web service, calls its add function, and, and returns its results. So that's pretty cool. Now let me show you those two really quickly. So back into where, back into Delphi. If I take a look at uh, the first one we saw, a currency exchange, uh, very similar to what we did before in Indy HTTP component. So um, I'm passing it this uh, URL, and then the, the two edit boxes in there are, are appending my, uh, my from and to uh, of what I want exchanged. And I'm sending it to a, uh, uh, it comes back as a JSON object. I parsed a JSON object looking for the value, and then I uh, send the result. Uh, to to my label for for the uh, WSDL calculator. Let me show you that one. For, so for the WSDL calculator, for in, in this case, I'm using a HTTP uh, remote interface object. So I I kind of love this component because it it reads the description of the required web service interface and it generates for me the the virtual method table and the adopt and the adapter methods and it returns a reference to the created uh, uh, VMT table. So that's also pretty cool. So what I did in this case, there's a there's a web service out there, which is this. I have this calculator uh, Wisdle out there. And I went over here and I did file, uh, new, other, uh, from web services. There's a WSDL importer. So I gave it the uh, I gave it the location of this WSDL, and what gets returned to me is this interface file. So any WSDL that's out there, you can do this. So you can you can run the WSDL through the WSDL importer. It's going to return this interface file for you that has all the functions on that WSDL. In this case, add, divide, multiply, and subtract. And then I can use uh, these functions uh, inside my application. So if I call its um, get i calculator, and then I have access to add, divide, multiply, and subtract. So what I did in my application, I dropped uh, two edit buttons. Uh, this is a button because it's iOS. So I have these great uh, style lookups I can apply. So I picked it as a as an add button to give it to give it that look and feel. So when I click that button. Uh, it's going to take the two values I put into my two edit boxes. I'm going to call the get i calculator, the add function in there, pass it these two values. It's going to return, it's going to do its add for me and return the answer uh, back to me. And I display that in my, in my show message. And that's what we saw inside the iOS simulator. So that's all pr very cool also. All right. Next, iOS sensors. So what's great here is uh, Delphi for iOS 
also supports all these great iOS sensors like uh, like the orientation sensor. And with that, I have access to uh, gyroscope and, and compass, so I can get X, Y, and Z and, and tilt values. I can get X, Y, and Z and, and distance values. We also support the, the motion sensor, the accelerometer. So I can use that to detect motion in my application as I move my iOS device around. I can determine speed and determine motion. We also have access to the location sensor. So that's commonly used in applications that, that require you know, location awareness. And what's great about that component, it's going to return to my iOS device the, the latitude and the longitude of where I am. It also gives me access to reverse geocoding. So it's going to convert my location data to a very readable address like we see here. So when we turn on location sensor, it's going to give me my latitude and my longitude. And then from there, I can do reverse geocoding and get all this great uh, readable address information exactly where I am uh, right down to the uh, individual address of where I am and this also works on Win, Mac and iOS and in the example we see here and this is example I'm going to show you I, I dropped the web browser on here and then I added uh, uh, Google Maps on here and I passed the longitude and latitude to Google Maps and it displayed my location on inside of a Google Map and sensors we also have access to the camera so for the camera I have access to the camera sensors like I can activate the flash, I can access the front or uh, and or the back of the camera. So let's take a look at some of these uh, iOS sensors that we can do inside of Delphi XE4 for iOS. So let's take a look at some sensors. So the first one I want to look at is uh, location. So what I've done here is I have a I have a location sensor. Location sensor has an event on on as a location sensor, so uh, when I when the location changes, uh, it's going to give me my new latitude and longitude position. So that's also cool what it does. Um, to display it, I have a I have two list boxes here that are going to display the values of latitude and longitude. Also on this application, I dropped a a web browser. So what's going to happen here? is when I when I turn on when I activate the sensor it's going to give me my latitude and my longitude I'm going to take that information and inside my web browser component I'm going to send it to maps.google.com pass it the longitude and the latitude I got from my location sensor and that's going to display it uh, inside my web browser component and then with uh, the location information I can also do reverse geocoding and and with that it's going to give me all this usable readable address information like the admin area country code and I'm going to display all of that on these list box items that I have here so now a, a uh, an actual simulator does not have real uh, location information so in this case I'm going to send it to my iOS device and this is going to display in, in an iPad. I believe this is going out to my iOS device. So I'm going to just run this on my actual device. So same process, uh, build it here locally, go through Platform Assist. This case, through my USB connected iPad 3, uh, it will uh, load it to my actual iPad 3 and, and display it. So I'm going to turn on my iPad 3 for you now so you can see this. So building here, sends it to my iPad 3, fires it up. Autom I have the, in this case, I have a custom orientation, so it already, already rotate, rotates it horizontally with the home button on the left. I'm going to turn on location sensor, immediately gets my latitude and longitude, uh, sends that information to maps.google.com, and there's my location, so I am in New York in the town of Carl Place in the sub locale of North Hempstead on Knollwood Drive. So that's very cool, very powerful a component to give you all of this information. So every time I do this it's it's uh, it's still it's still very cool to me to see. All right, let me uh, let me turn off my iPad. 
And let's continue. Let's see. Uh, for sensors, let's let's see. I'm just going to check on time again. Yeah, we're still doing fine. Uh, let's take a look at one more iOS uh, sensor example. Let's take a look at the camera. So for iOS sensors, let me take a look at the iOS uh, camera component. So for the iOS camera component, we have a, make this bigger so you can see it. We have a, we have a, ca a camera component and the camera component, it's a, it's a non-visual component for a camera device. And we're going to see to actually display the data on a on an actual bitmap. Uh, we use this we use this uh, sample buffer to bitmap method, and, and I'll and I'll show you that. So to use this to use this T camera component on an iOS device, uh, there is a there's a kind property that we use to specify which camera is being used. So when we take a look. Uh, what I did here uh, for this camera type, I created this uh, segmented button here for front and back for the camera flash type. I have three speed buttons here and I grouped them into this segmented group here. So for camera type front, for example, for the camera component, there's a, there's a kind property and that's used to specify which camera is being used. Is it the front camera or the back camera? And then there's an active property to specify the camera is either active or inactive. So that's the active component. And then to actually display uh, what the camera sees inside of an image, it's this uh, sample buffer to uh, the bit bat method, which is right here. So when the camera gets turned on, what it sees from the sample buffer to bitmap method, I pass to the image I have on my form. So I pass its bitmap width and its bitmap height uh, to the actual device. So that's how that works. So that's also pretty cool. All right, let's continue. So the next thing we want to take a look at is uh, iOS Notification Center. Uh, so Delphi for iOS supports um, local notifications. So for example, we can do things like uh, sending scheduled notifications and, and sending a local notification immediately, cancel all the notifications. Uh, we can set the badge number uh, for an application icon. So for example, when you have a, you know, an email icon and you still have 18 more emails to read or 18 more text messages, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the little badge icon up there that you can set, set values to. So the key basic notification or alert styles that we can, uh, we can control is, for example, a badge on an application icon, uh, the notification banner on the iPad, a notification alerts, and notification center on iPad. Now, and if you haven't not seen it also, uh, Anders, who I believe is still on this call, uh, he posted this great video up on YouTube on how to use Delphi XE4 iOS uh, using Apple's push notification services. So that's also very, very cool. So if you haven't seen that video already, it's, it's great, great to take a look at that. So let's take a look at some of the... Uh, hey, hey, Al. Uh, yes. No, Anders is right yes. here. And, uh, Anders, again, yes, Anders. please, please. Please feel free to uh, elaborate on your on your most excellent, awesome uh, Apple push notification services. Uh, is this the one from uh, from uh, Code Rage Mobile? Correct. All right. Yeah. So that's a uh, uh, basically a demonstration of a uh, piece of work that uh, one of our MVPs to put together. He created a uh, push notification server in VCL. I ported it to uh, FireMonkey. So you can run your uh, push notification server on uh, both uh, Windows and Macintosh and then push notifications to uh, your iPad or your iPhone. Yeah, so watch that, uh, watch that video for sure. And Andrews also, has a, Andrews also has a blog. Yep. There's a blog post, so you can go to blogs.embarkadero.com slash AO for Andrews Olson. And there you go. Excellent. 
All right, so for notification, let's take a look at some examples for that. Uh, notifications, let's take a look at uh, sending uh, notifications. So what we have here is, first thing we see is for notifications, uh, the notification service uh, interface um, is defined, the, the FMX Notification Center, it's defined as one of the FireMonkey uh, platform services. So that's how we implemented. So the, the FireMonkey Notification Center was uh, implemented as one of the FireMonkey platform services. So the first thing we do for notification services is we first verify that the device actually supports notification services. So using, using platform services, we check to see if uh, notification services is supported. If it is supported, then we create an instance of, of T notification. And once we have that, then we can set the notification name to whatever we want. We can send the alert body to whatever we want. And then we can decide when do we want to send this notification. So we can either send it now immediately or we can control the fire date to say, in this case, I want to send it 10 seconds from now. And then last thing we do is actually um, send the notification uh, by doing this. So let me run this on my actual device and I'll show you what this looks like. So if you're familiar with the notifications, like if you have an iPad or an iPhone, you got you have the drop down on the uh, on the top where you can you can be sent notifications and, and alerts. Let's uh, say you're a medical doctor and uh, uh, working in a uh, you know kidney dialysis environment, and you know, if, a, if a lab result comes back wrong, you know you want to immediately send that result to your uh, to to your doctor to notify him or her that you know there's a there's a patient in critical need. So you know it's kind of a urgent need to send notifications. So here's what it looks like. Oh, you can't see it until I turn it on. Let me show you my iPad. So here's the application running on my iPad. Uh, how notifications work uh, up on the top. You see the little drop down. So right now we have no no new notifications from Notification Center. So if, I, so if I send the scheduled notification, uh, so right now the application is running. So right now the application is running, so the application, the notification gets sent. Uh, if, I, if I send it, if I send it, and in this case I waited 10 seconds, I can close the app and then 10 seconds later, even with the app closed, the notification will uh, will still work for me. So if I send it immediately, we get it sent immediately. So that's real cool we can do this. So let me see if I can do uh, um, with the app closed. So if I send a schedule notification and I shut down the app, and if we wait the 10 seconds, uh, eventually the uh, the notification will pop up. If we if we wait the 10 seconds for it to uh, just and there and there she is. So whether the app is running or whether the app is closed, uh, not notifications work quite fine and and exactly how they're supposed to. So that's also very cool. And it's all controlled by the iOS device. Let me see, any other cool notifications I wanted to show you? I can show you the badge icon, which I have here. So this is, this is the app. Uh, let, me sh let me do it. Well, let me show you the app first. File close all. For notifications, this is how you can actually set the, uh, the badge uh, on an icon. So for example, this is the application. This is the application here. When I click it, um, say, say you had an icon for setting a, for some, some types of email. So let's say I got 35 emails still to read. 
if I set the badge, so not, now that icon, I have 35. So very easy to set and, and reset uh, the badge uh, inside of, of any icon using, using notification. So if I go back into the app and I reset the badge back to zero, and then the, the badge goes away. So similar to how we did it with uh, uh, the, not the notifications we just saw previous, uh, same, same way it works here. Once again, we first check to see if notification is supported on the platform, and then if it is, we can set and reset uh, the badge icon uh, using notification services. So that also works quite well and exactly as it should. All right, let me continue. All right, the next thing we want to look at is uh, Delphi iOS being enterprise ready. So what do I mean by this? So, so Delphi for iOS, so think of this as your, your iOS device, your iPad, your, your, uh, your iPhone, or your uh, iPod Touch. So, so Delphi iOS, it, it's ready to access either your embedded Intrabase database or, or a, SQLite uh, a SQLite database. So I can embed Intrabase and or SQLite inside my iOS device and that's very cool. And it's also enterprise database ready to get to any of your backend, you know, remote SQL Server database. So if you got if you got Oracle or MS SQL or DB2 or Sybase or any of the other backend databases, um, we can connect to those databases using our uh, DataSnap technology. So so the iOS devices, the Delphi iOS applications can connect to a DataSnap service, and then from a DataSnap service, it can access these backend remote databases and send that information back uh, to the iOS devices. So in addition, uh, what I'm going to call any other type of data snap client, so it could be a, it could be a, a native Windows application, a, a web HTML page and or any other type of mobile app using our mobile connectors such as a, you know, a Blackberry, a, a Windows phone, an Android, an iOS device through mobile connectors, they also can connect to a data snap service and access the backend data. And inside a data snap service, uh, we also have server methods. So what's nice about data snap, it's built either using C++ Builder and or Delphi, and you can reuse and you can re-leverage all your existing uh, Delphi methods and functions and stick them inside a data snap server, inside the server methods, and be able to reuse them, call them from an iOS device or any of these other um, what I'm going to call client. So as you can see, uh, DataSnap fully supports REST and, and or SOAP to connect to a DataSnap service and either using our DB Express components or our new FireDAC components access the backend data and return the results back to the call-in clients. So for the, for the iOS local databases, so, so today uh, Apple only allows two databases to be embedded inside an iOS device, either the SQLite database or our own uh, Intrabase database. So if you need a, a very fully featured, secure, and encrypted database that, that's full SQL 92 compliant, that has fast multi-read and write, uh, then Intrabase is a great database to embed inside your iOS device. Uh, so in addition, so Interbase comes in two flavors. There's a there's an there's an IB Lite version and an Interbase to go version. So the IB Lite version is a is an also embeddable inside your iOS device, and you'll see it's included uh, you, you included in your Red Studio editions, and in I think also in uh, uh, in Delphi Professional with the mobile add-on, you'll get a. Uh, you'll get a license key to embed Intrabase Lite inside your iOS devices. So if you need, uh, if you need an embeddable free database, Intrabase IB Lite, and, and the database is going to be less than 100 megabytes, and you, can, you only need one simultaneous user, and you don't need it to be encrypted, and you don't need any uh, strong SSL encryption, if you don't need the database encrypted or the column encrypted, and you, know, you can get by with just one CPU core, then IB Lite free 
is a great embeddable database inside your iOS devices. If you want that embeddable database to be encrypted and use strong you know, encrypted database and the columns and you want strong encryption, SSL level encryption, and you want multiple simultaneous users and be able to use multiple CPU and cores, then you can use Interbase to go. So both Interbase to go and Interbase Lite light are, are available to be embedded inside your iOS device. So for the IB, the IB Lite, the free edition, so it's a, it's a free feature, free feature limited version of uh, Interbase for iOS for those limits we saw on the, on the previous page. So you can take this IB Lite and you can drop it into your free and or your paid apps and deploy it to the Apple Store and the inside of your Red Studio, the, the license key comes with it. So let's take a look at an example of, uh, of IB Lite embedded inside of an iOS device. So if you ever used uh, you know DB Express before, same same concept here. So on, on on this app, I dropped a I dropped a list view, and in this list view, I want to display the results from my uh, from my in this case my embedded interbase database. So like if you're familiar with uh, if you ever used uh, like DB Express or or BDE, it's it's kind of the same. So I drop a uh, I dropped a SQL connection onto the form. Uh, this the driver. I'm using the IB Lite or the or the to-go editions. All the other drivers should be here also. In this case, I'm going IB Lite. Because the database is actually going to get deployed to the device, I don't really need to give it the database name here, but I'll give the iOS device the actual database name. So I drop my SQL connection, and then I have two uh, SQL queries. So uh, I want this to be like a uh, uh, like a shopping list type of application where I either want to add items to my list or I want to delete items from my list. So I have one query, I have my SQL delete query, so I'm going to select an item from my list and whatever I select I want to delete that from my uh, database and I also have a query insert and when I click the plus button it'll do an input query and it'll insert those items uh, into my database also. And I have a SQL data set that's attached to my, uh, my SQL connection. Now, I believe when I created this, I used Visual Live Bindings, which makes it easy for me. So when I drop my, my SQL data set component onto the form, it created this, this visual uh, design link here, and I dropped my list view on the form and it created it here. And then all I had to do was say, I want to take the task name, which is the column in my database, and I want it to be the the text inside of my list view. So just by making this uh, visual live bindings connection, uh, it, it does that for me, and, that, and that's very cool. So now let me go ahead and run this application and show you what it looks like. So let me send it to, uh, let me send it to the simulator. So it'll work exactly the same on the simulator and the device, and just show you how we actually bundle the interbase inside of here. I think I quickly showed you it with the US Capital example, but I'll show you here again on the project deployment. So here's my here's my interbase database, you know, tasks.gdb, and I'm telling the iOS device it lives in, in directory startup slash documents. And this is my interbase light license key that I'm also sending to the iOS device and I'm telling it it lives in startup documents interbase license. So how does the iOS device know about that? Under under my form, when this form actually gets created. So when, in this case, when it created, just in case I had some values in that database already, I just told it to populate the list view with, with every items I have in there. And to make the connection, I did it on my, my, SQL, my SQL connection, and I'll show you where that is. So on my SQL connection, uh, before the connect, I said before we actually do the connection, if this is if this is running on an iOS device, this is where I'm telling the iOS device where to find my actual database called task.gdb. Uh, there's a great parameter environmental variable called get home path. 
it's part of our uh, system sysutils. It's a great way, it's a great uh, value to use for, for multiple platforms. So it'll give me the, uh, the home directory of the platform I'm going to. So in this case, when it goes up to the iOS device, it says, uh, look, in, look in startup slash uh, documents slash uh, tasks.gdb. And that's what this corresponds to, startup slash documents to find my task.gdb. And these are all the other uh, files that, that get deployed, and most of them are the, the icons used for the splash screen and whatever other libraries I need. So now if I run this on my simulator, we'll see what this looks like. So think of this as a shopping list where I have, uh, I have my embedded interbase database and I have uh, tasks names in there and I want to be able to add new items and I want to select items and, and delete them if I don't need them anymore. And Al, so just a reminder it. while it's building and deploying, on the device, these file names are case sensitive. On the so task.gdb all uppercase needs to be the name of that file. Documents with a capital D needs to be capital D, and the startup with a capital S, capital U. And I think Anders, uh, we found out that if you run on the simulator, uh, it's not case sensitive, right? Uh, yeah, at least sometimes. At least sometimes. Okay, Which is so, weird. You're, so you're, you're, you are you are correct. Thank you, thank you for reminding. Because I spent many many hours debugging trying to figure out why I could not find my file. Yeah. So as so as as David mentioned, the the case sensitivity. So for example, startup, st, you know, capital S and then capital U and then documents capital D. So and yeah, very that, important. So when you when you're doing this, yeah, make sure you do this correctly. And then file name task.gdb which is all uppercase when you're deploying it. So that's why the code has to have that same all uppercase string there uh, to be task.gdb there. So if it says can't find database, uh, something like that, then take a look at things like path, upper lowercase, and the file name, uh, which is not the case right. on, yeah. on Windows. You can do whatever you want, of course. You 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 are correct, and the, I, I I wrote a couple of apps apps to actually go into the file directories on the iOS, which is really cool. How those actual file names on the iOS actually look to 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 go actually through the file directory structure uh, to actually see the files that get they get put out there. And if we have time, I'll I'll show you that app too because it's really cool. It goes through the path structure and it shows you exactly where on the iOS device it really puts these. You know, we're calling them startup slash documents, but then on the actual iOS device, it's something like var, some uh, some GUID number, and you, and you see where it gets sent. Yeah, that's the whole sandboxing to sandbox your app bundle, so that when it runs, it goes into this. As far as your app is concerned, this startup. And startup is the root directory, and you can put things in that startup directory that are not uh, that are not updatable. Uh, the other point that somebody uh, clued me in on is documents and everything below. When you do your backup with iTunes, if you back up your device, it will also back up your documents and directories below that uh, for your application to make sure that you get any INI files or updated files that you have that those get backed up. But anything that's in the yeah, app excellent. bundle or the startup itself will not be backed up by iTunes. You know, correct. Excellent point, right? So now you have this new iCloud uh, backup facility, automatic. So great yep. point. So yes, anything that's in anything that's under startup documents becomes part of the automatic backup procedure. So so thank you for bringing up that point, David. Yep. M most excellent. Sorry for so he, bump. So, bump here's, so here's what the here's what the app looks like. Uh, the plus button will run my uh, SQL insert. And where where it actually gets this uh, enter new task from? Let me show you where that comes from. So I'm using a I'm using this input query, input query, uh, enter new task, task and task name. So that's why I uh, give it a new task name, and then I I call my SQL query insert. I execute it, and that enters the inserts the task name into my uh, embedded interbase database on the device. So very cool. And I believe so let's say we do. Al, one last yeah. thing. Sorry to give you giving you. No worries. No worries. No. Input, feel free. Feel free. Feel free to comment query. anytime. No. Someone asked me on input query, could they have multiple inputs in the input query? And yes, if you just put in 
uh, additional parameters. For example, if you might want to use input query to do a login where you'd have to put in username and password. In this case, you're only asking for one field, but you can use input query to pass uh, two or, or more fields as well. You're using one. Excellent. Method. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so this is great. Yeah, I love this input query for, for what it does. So input query on an iOS device looks like this. So I want to enter some new tasks. So maybe we want to do some requirements. And maybe we want to do some design. And maybe we want to do some testing. But, you know, we're a bunch of developers, so we don't really need requirements. We can delete that. We don't really care about design, and we don't have to test out code because it's also great, so we can delete that too. All we need to do is code because it's all about the code. So, so what's cool about this, there's an embedded uh, interface database inside this iOS device, and this is a, a freely uh, deployable, no, re no redistribution fees that you can embed inside of, a, of an iOS device. So, so very cool. Okay, I think we covered all, and the same exact, the same same thing works for uh, for SQLite. So file close all, save changes. I said no. So I think I have the equivalent for for SQLite. So that was the interbase light version and the exact same version for for SQLite, built exactly the same way. And if we look at its its deployment, in this case we we're deploying a a SQLite database instead. All right, next. All right, FireDAC. So uh, FireDAC is our new multi-device data access library. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, I think a couple of months ago, Embarcadero acquired the company uh, AnyDAC from DA Soft Technologies, and we renamed their AnyDAC components to, to FireDAC. So FireDAC is a set of a very high-speed uh, database access components for, for all these popular uh, SQL databases. So from, from Red Studio, Delphi, and or C++ Builder, you have access to all the popular uh, SQL databases out there, including uh, access to our data, DataSnap uh, servers also. So the, the FireDAC data access structure, you know, very, very similar to our own uh, I don't know, DB Express components and or the BDE. So you know, so at the at the base level, so at the base level we have this we have this physical level. I'm trying to find my cursor. So at the base level, uh, there's a physical level for the for the native drivers. And and at the, so this base level, this physical driver, these are these are the FireDAC drivers to access the uh, the DBMS uh, clients. Then we have this uh, data adapter layer, and this is where data is mapped into the internal structures of a FireDAC uh, into its local uh, data storage. And then, if we go, then if we went in the opposite direction, uh, this this data adapter uh, that can convert the changes in the data cache into the SQL commands, and that does the updating, the deleting, and you know, uh, the browsing. And then those drivers actually execute the commands. Now, this this local data storage, uh, this is relational storage of records in memory. So it's very similar to a data table or a data view or a or a data source. So it's like a mini database management system in memory. And then at the at the very top level, we have our non-visual classical components like our connection and our query. And then we have these visual components. Like the like the physical drivers and the uh, and the weight cursors and the weight cursors. So the primary goal of a FireMonkey was to is to be a multi-platform library for the VCL console apps, FireMonkey, FireMonkey iOS, and plus whatever new platforms Embarcadero uh, decide, decides to add. So so this variety of platforms all needed to be isolated. So all of this functionality needed to be isolated uh, to, to these separate layers. So for example, now the FireDAC library itself, you know, does not depend on any, you know, forms dot, that, that, you know, pass file. So that's really cool. So let me show you some quick examples on, uh, on FireDAC. Just 
checking time. I think we're doing just fine. Uh, fire deck. Uh, first, let me show you a, a VCL example. So on my box, I have a, I also have a, My, uh, a MySQL database. So the minimum components you need for Fire Deck are, are just these three, all these, these five right here. So I have, so I dropped a, a DB, this is a VCL application. I dropped a, a DB grid onto the form. I have a Fire Deck. So if we look at these components, AD, you'll see all these Fire Deck components on here. So you have a whole set of uh, Fire Deck components on here. Fire Deck UI, Fire Deck Links, Fire Deck Services. When you install Fire Deck into your IDE, you're going to see this Fire Deck on the top here. And just like DB Express, so those are familiar with DB Express, right? I can come into DB Express. I can click on a uh, on a table. I could view it and get the information using DB Express. Fire Deck very similar for Fire Deck. Also has an Explorer. In this case, I have some interbase database defined. I have my MySQL database defined. Log into MySQL. Take a look at some of its databases, like my OS Commerce database. Take a look at some of the tables in there. So it kind of works the same way. So Fire Deck has an Explorer. DB Express has an Explorer. So. Uh, just like we do with DB Express, we drop components on here. So there's a there's an AD connection component and driver's name. I set it to MySQL. All the other database drivers already also supported under its parameters. You know the minimum settings I need is for MySQL the driver ID, uh, the location of this instance of MySQL. In this case, it's on my local host. Uh, the database I want to go after, in this case it's my OS Commerce and the uh, the ID and the password of the database. For the query component, similar, drop a query component on there. For this query component, I'm just saying select everything from the countries table inside of my MySQL database. And then we have a data source and data source gets set to the uh, uh, AD uh, query component. And then to actually deploy this to an application, I need two additional components. One is the actual physical driver. So there's a, is a physical MySQL link driver component and a, a GUI wait curse component. You see from the GUI wait curse component under its provider, uh, I have three options. Either in my case, it's a, it's a, in this case, it's a, a VCL forms application. It can also be a FireMonkey application. Or a or a console application. In this case, it's a forms application. And by by dropping these two components on here, it's adding it to my users clauses. So it's adding this uh, this physical MySQL component and this GUI forms wait component. So this is the this is the hourglass you see when it's actually going out and doing the fetching and waiting for something to come back. So dropping those two components as these two units to my users clauses. So if I go and, and and similar, similar to like apply updates. So in this case, when I when I select apply updates, it's the AD query component dot apply updates. So uh, unidirectional. So any changes I make to the uh, to the application here will get updated to the database. Any changes to the database will get updated on the form. So if I run this as a VCL application, uh, we see it here. And if I say make some changes, like country ID, maybe this becomes a one. And I apply updates. So if I come out and I run it again, we'll see that the one uh, the one applies for me. So that's a quick look at. Uh, Fire Deck using VCL, and the same thing works for iOS applications. Close all. And for example, another Fire Deck application. Here's a, it's another example of a, a Fire Deck with an iOS application. In this case, I'm using a data module. Same, uh, same approach, and in, in this case, I'm going to an embedded interbase database. So I have my, my Fire Deck connections here, embeddable interbase database, uh, query components. 
So this, this is similar to how we saw with the uh, RSS feeds application. I'm going out to a, I'll show you what the form looks like. Um, I'm going out to a, an XML a feed XML site to pull down hotels from an XML application um, and, and populate uh, the screen with that information. So when I click on this button, it's going to a it's going to an XML website, and it's going to give me a list of hotels from an XML file and populate the uh, the, li the list view with that information. So it's going out to this going out to this site, grabbing this XML file, and just like we did with the RSS feeds, parsing the XML file, pulling out ho hotel information, and in this case, it's storing them into my embedded interbase database on my device. So that's also very cool, also. Let me see. Let me do this to my actual device. Show you how this looks. Check it on time. Yeah, we're still fine. Run and run. So this is using FireDAC, an embeddable interbase database, uh, using the Indy HTTP component with the XML document component to go out to a website, grab an XML document, parse the XML document, uh, looking for a list of hotels. In this case, it's going to uh, 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 Taiwan. So a lot, of, a lot of Unicode characters should come back uh, based, on the ho uh, based on their hotel names. And then the uh, once we once we see a hotel we like, we'll select it, and that'll get added into my embedded interbase database. And then it gets added to my favorites list. So if I'm in that area again and I'm looking for a hotel, I can go to my favorite lists and uh, and take a look at the hotels I've been to. And then I can make comments on those hotels. And uh, uh, so next time I'm there, then I can share this information with, with with other folks that I know who are also looking for hotels also. Here's this app running on my iPad 3. Uh, I can tell you what the first one is, uh, Westgate Hotel. So I went out to the, uh, went out to that XML, went out to that site, grabbed that XML document, parsed it, and displayed it in my, uh, in my list. So now I can select one of these hotels. This is now doing like a master detail lookup. So when I select one of the hotels, it does a, it does a master detail, and once again sends it to my Google Map, passes it the longitude and latitude of where that hotel is, and displays it on my, on my map. So and then at this point, I can choose to uh, comment on it. I can make it one of my favorites, and this all gets embedded into my uh, embeddable interbase database. So that's also very cool. Okay. All right. So that was an example of FireDAC with an embedded interbase database on a uh, on an iOS uh, device. So once again, very very cool. All right, let me just turn off my my iPad, and we will continue. All right, so now that everybody loves what they saw about FireDAC, how do you actually go about getting FireDAC? So you can get FireDAC uh, these three ways. So you get, we, got, we got FireDAC for iOS only. So that's a free download for users of Rad Studio Pro, Delphi Pro with, with mobile add-on. You can also get FireDAC uh, for Windows, Mac, and iOS. That's also a free download for uh, registered users of Rad Studio, Delphi, and or CBuilder. Or you can purchase as a FireDAC client server add-on pack for, for Rad Studio, uh, Delphi, and or CBuilder professional edition. And uh, if you want to try it out now, we just came out with this new Delphi XE4 instant trial uh, that includes the, the Fire DAC trial also. So this is just Delphi without without Rad Studio. So if you want to try Fire DAC with just Delphi XE4, uh, there's uh, up on our regular download site. You can now download XE4 instant trial that includes the Fire DAC trial, and that's how you can get Fire DAC and and test it out yourself. All right, visual uh, live binding. So we, we saw some of this already uh, with the IB Light application. Uh, with Delphi iOS, you can now use visual live bindings for um, rapid prototyping and, and binding controls to, to database columns and or binding controls to other control columns, you know, such as list boxes, edit boxes, labels. So, so for example, this, this application is showing a uh, 
a master detail recipes type of application. Uh, it has, so we dropped the recipes table onto the, onto the form. Uh, we're inside of visual live bindings. We see the recipe tables inside of visual live bindings. On the actual application, we dropped two list boxes. One is going to be my master list box. One is going to be my detail list box. So we're saying on the, on the master box, I want the text item of my list box to be equal to the recipe name. And then on my second list box, I'm going to call it my detail list box. So when I select an item from my first list box, send it over to my second tab, which has my list box one. And on there, I want to display not only the title, but the subtitle and the description of it. And then um, other, other controls I dropped onto the forms, you know, some memos and the, the values, the text value inside those memos, I set them to be specific columns of, from, my, from my database. So we can take a look at some uh, visual live bindings examples now. Uh, let's start with this one. So for this application, all right, I set up, have it set up as an iPad in horizontal, and I dropped two, uh, I, I dropped two, uh, two layouts out here. I have a, I have a, I have my left layout and my my right layout. On my left layout, I dropped a, I dropped a list view. And on my right layout, I have some, uh, I have a memo component. It has some labels and and images. And I added hi higher higher date here also. So to help me design this application, I'm using a visual live binding. So if I go to view uh, live bindings designer, it drops up. Uh, this visual live bindings designer. So let's say I don't I don't have my database yet, so I need to prototype this application. So I drop this component called prototype bind source on the application. And if I right click on it, I'm able to add fields. So here with this prototype bind source component, we have we have generated all these different types of fields like integers and strings and bitmaps, booleans, currency you know, dates and times. So to map to the actual columns that are going to be in your database, I can use this prototype bind source uh, to simulate the, the columns and the fields that are in my actual database before I actually have my actual database. So I selected a bunch of fields. In this case, I selected these fields from the prototype. Um, some bitmap fields, some names, some titles, some date fields. And then when I bring up visual live bindings, this is the prototype bind source uh, component here with those columns that I got uh, from my added fields. And here's my, here's my list view. So on the, on the left side list view, I'm saying take the text item and set that to be my contact name. And then for these components on my right side, for example, the, the memo, I want the memo field to be equal to this column. The bitmap is equal to this column. The name is equal to this. The, the calendar edit I put in there is the, is the date field from my prototype. So once I build the application and I get it looking the way I like to look, want, want it to look, then all I have to do is come up to my data explorer. Once I get my real database, and then drop its table from Data Explorer onto the form, and it'll create my client data set here. Then all I need to do is replace this prototype bind source with the actual values from my, from my database. So once I get my user interface looking exactly the way I like with my prototype bind source, I drop, a, I drop my real database, my client data set onto the form, and then I simply replace prototype bind source with the actual client data set, and now I'm getting real data onto the form. So that's kind of the, uh, the flow of, uh, of rapid prototyping using visual live bindings. All right, let me continue. All right, data snap. So data snap uh, has been around for, for quite a while now. 
So this is, I'm, I call this my data snap, my rad studio framework with rad cloud services. So, so with data snap, you know, I can access, rem, I can access remote services and I can connect to my data snap servers from my, from my iOS devices or from any of these mobile clients or any of these, what I'm going to call data snap clients, right? They could be native windows applications, web clients, or any of these mobile clients, including the Delphi for iOS uh, clients you create. DataSnap also has mobile connectors, so I can have a Windows Phone, a BlackBerry, uh, a PHP, HTML5, a Microsoft.NET C# -sharp application. They can all they all know how to connect to a to a DataSnap service, access those methods you have inside of a DataSnap service, call those methods. They can also get to any of these backend uh, databases, and they can return that information uh, back to the calling client. Now these DataSnap services are very lightweight, very small. So they're already certified, both the data snap service and an interbase database, they're already certified uh, to exist inside of cloud services. So you can take a data snap service uh, with an interbase database and in a, in, a, in a micro instance, the smallest instance you can, you can have on a cloud service, either an Amazon or, or a Windows Azure cloud, you can host them on a, on a cloud instance and then you can have your users connect to the data snap service in the cloud, access its methods, get to the backend database, return the results to the, uh, to the call and client. So why is this multi-tier on, on iOS so important? Because on these, on these iOS devices, uh, you have very limited uh, RDBMS client libraries on the iOS device. So for example, there is no you know, Microsoft SQL Server client library you can put on an iOS device. So the only way an iOS device is going to get to a backend Microsoft SQL Server database is either go through a web service or go through our data snap service. And, and you cannot deploy a, uh, a Mac dilib file, that's the Mac equivalent of a DLL, into an app package uh, for the App Store. Apple just does not allow that. So you have very limited database connectivities on an iOS device. So the good news is by using a a data snap server with your Delphi for iOS client, you can use that as your unified conduit to get to any backend database and return the results back to the uh, to the calling device. So that's also very cool. So let's take a look at some uh, um, applications. Uh, first one I want to show you is a, a mobile, a Delphi iOS application connecting to a data snap service that's sitting up in an Amazon uh, EC2 cloud. So this is a, I'm going to call this a, a chat application, very similar to the chat window you're seeing in your in your GoToWebinar meeting now. You you select either an individual, send that individual privately a message, or you can send messages to the whole group. So uh, we did the same thing using this uh, application we call FireChat, and let me show you what this looks like. I'm going to at least leave a couple of minutes at the end for questions. So let me go, let me go about five more minutes. So those of you who are unfamiliar with DataSnap, DataSnap's been in the Enterprise Edition or, or, or above for quite a while now. So on the new other uh, DataSnap servers can be created either on, in C++ Builder, DataSnap servers, or under Delphi uh, data snap service. So you have several examples of data snap service here, such as a data snap rest uh, application can be created, which is what I did in my case. So you run through this wizard, it creates this skeleton uh, data snap service. With the, with the files that get created is a, is a server file, and inside the server file is where you put your methods that you want to expose So inside the server methods file, here's where you put your methods that you want to expose to the calling client. So in this case, I exposed a, a few methods here. So I have one method called uh, get user list, and this is going to return the names of all the users actively logged in. I have another method called send message. This sends a message to all users in the chat room, and another method function called uh, send a message to the uh, specific chat room users. So when I start up this data snap service, it looks like this. So it's a it's a Windows, so you see it's a Win32 bit executable, so it looks like this. So I have this data snap service running in an Amazon EC2 cloud, and I'm going to take its client, which 
looks like this. So here's the client with its front login screen. So it's a three three tab three tab client. Uh, I already have it sitting in my simulator, which is this. So here's the Delphi iOS client. Uh, right now, the DataSnap service is running in this Amazon EC2 cloud at this IP address, listening in a, on this port. So I'm going to connect to it. Let's call it Al, uh, Delphi iOS. So this client is now connected to my DataSnap service sitting in the Amazon Amazon cloud. It's connected there. There, there I am. I see all the other folks that are that are out there active. So these are all the users that are also connected that I can chat to individually, or I can send messages to everyone. So this is one quick example of how you can take a DataSnap service, uh, host it in an Amazon cloud, and then have iOS clients connect to it, access the business methods on that uh, service and return the results back to the calling client. Okay. And and now we can extend the data snap service and have it connect to back end database. And that would look something like this. So on the same so Victoria looks like this. So I can have iOS clients, Delphi iOS clients, or these could be Blackberry clients or Windows phone clients using our mobile connectors, Android clients, mobile connectors. They all know how to connect to this data snap service, access the methods on a data snap service, return the results back to the call and client. Uh, JSON objects get returned, name value pairs, so we parse those JSON objects and display the results. Uh, web front end clients like a, like an HTML5 web page can also connect to a data snap service, access the methods, return results back to the client. I can also have data snap services using the FireDAC connectors, connect to back end remote databases. So let's say on this data snap service, I have a function called get records and knows how to connect to my back end database and return results back to the client. Another great part of data snap is I can add uh, compression and security filters. Uh, so as the data is going over the wire, it's compressed and it's encrypted. So it's very safe and secure. So that's all part of, of data snap also. All right. Uh, native and custom styling. So. Uh, by default, you have your you have your, uh, your iOS default you know, style that we give you out of the box. Uh, you could also add custom styling to the application. So we have a style sheet. You can take a style sheet. This is called like a Jet a Jet style. You can apply it to your iOS application, and that gets uh, submitted uh, to your application, both the Retina and and non Retina display. So there's a there's a property. Uh, called style book. You drop that onto the form. You load a style. You load the style sheet into the application, and then the the form inherits the style like like we see here. We can also do native and custom styling for for tab icons. So the the tabs that you put onto your application. So we include the standard uh, tabs and the standard tab items, but you can create your own. Uh, custom tab icons, both uh, non-retina and retina display, uh, standard resolution, high resolution, and those can get deployed with your app application also. Uh, for layout managements, we fully support all of the alignments, the anchors, the form family. Form family, this gets guessed a lot. You know, if I'm on an iPhone or an iPad, and you got much more real estate on an iPad, so you can have multiple uh, you know, on an if you know, you can check you can check what device you're running on. If it's an iPhone, then display this user interface. If it's running on an iPad, which much more real estate, then I can choose to display a much larger form on that on that device, and that's done using this this form family property. Uh, fully support all the uh, all the gestures, like swipe and tap and tap. And pinch and zoom, tap and hold, and and double click. So that's also supported. So how that's going to work? So for example, on my form, I drop a I drop an image on the form. I add this gesture manager, a component onto it, 
and then inside uh, I have a touch property. I set the touch property to be equal to my gesture manager component and then on the interactive gestures I can enable zoom, pan, rotate, two finger tap, press and tap, double tap and long tap. So for example if in this case I enable zoom on the gesture event we're going to calculate where we were and where we want to be and then we'll, we'll zoom in and zoom out as, as needed. Uh, we also have extended action support so uh, for accessing the camera app and for doing uh, slide transitions for tab items we, we, we implemented this through, through action lists so through action lists we added extended action support for the camera, camera roll, share sheet and slide transactions for accessing the camera, accessing retrieving from the camera roll, uh, the share sheet functionality which gets you to you know, take a picture, uh, you want to open up share sheet and, and send that picture by email or to Facebook or to Twitter or to print it you know, using the, the air print technology and we also did extended actions for the slide transactions for the tab items in the, in the tab control. All right, so for all of you who are attending this webinar now, this is the uh, special discount code. So it's uh, MON for Montreal, TOR for Toronto, XE4-0613. And uh, in your follow-up emails, I, uh, I assume we're going to send this to you also. But for you on here right now, the code is MONTORXE4-0613. And what this code gives you, it gives you, uh, just for you folks attending this uh, launch tour, you get 15% off of the new XE4 release of Rad Studio, Delphi, and C Builder, uh, purchased by uh, June 28th through your Embarcadero sales rep or through uh, June 30th. Uh, use that coupon code at our store.embarcadero.com. And and Alice, yes. I chime in here just to clear up because I think there was a there was some confusion and there was a blog post I think out of Calgary. Uh, some of the attendees have tried to use this code just by going to the store front itself. You need to go to this specific u store URL or contact sales or send an email to sales um, because the store if you just go to store.marketer.com and then choose Delphi or Red Studio or whatever and try to put in this code it doesn't know about this code but this special URL does know about this code just wanted to clear that up to make sure people don't get confused thinking they'll just go to the store and put in a code somehow Remember right, that right. specific URL that you have there, uh, which right, is specific right. to this webinar discount. All right, very good. And, and just yeah. in case you're, you're 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 not able to write it down or remember it, uh, we'll in the follow-up email we'll we will send you this. You'll code get that link exactly. So you'll get it. Yep, the code right, so and, worry about... and that URL. Okay, great. So and in in addition, so I, I mentioned this previously in the beginning. So there's also the special offer. We're running through uh, the last day of this month, June 30th. So if you buy Rad Studio XE4, Delphi XE4, or C Builder XE4 now, you can save up to 450 bucks US dollars and get uh, $300 in, in free extras. So uh, you can save 40% off on the mobile add-on pack for Delphi XE Pro, and then you get these four great uh, extra add-ons for free valued up to $300 US. You get the TMS cloud ca cloud pack components for iOS so that's going to give you seamless access to cloud services including Dropbox, Skydive, Google Drive, Box, uh, Twitter, Facebook and more. Uh, the Meta VCL to Fire uh, Monkey Converter so if you have all the existing VCL applications, you want to convert them over to FireMonkey uh, and then get them over to the Mac and iOS. Uh, the Meta Converter does that great. The FireMonkey Premium Style Pack, we saw it under Custom Styles. Uh, we're going to give you two premium styles, uh, Jet and Diamond Styles for Windows, Mac, and iOS. And Mac in Cloud is a based Mac access. So exclusively uh, for the XE4 users, we have extended the trial. Uh, to give you 24 hours of, uh, of continuous usage uh, or and over uh, over the course of 30 days. So if you don't have a Mac on site yet, this Mac in cloud service lets you rent the platform assistant server 
and the iOS simulator to test your applications be before you get a Mac. And, and Al, if they go to this RAD offer page um, where we list each of those four promo items, there's a, now a watch video link for each one of the four that points you to Code Rage mobile replay sessions. So if you want to learn more about how to use these Cloud Pack or the Meta Converter or the Premium Styles or the Mac and Cloud, we have the videos from Code Rage mobile. You'll see a watch video link next to each one of them on the RAD Offer page. And again, the RAD Offer page is a different off set of offers from the webinar special. And I think the the final thing is if you already have XE4, you can go to your registered user download page and you'll see all four of these available for download uh, already for you because you're an XE4 customer. Excellent. Thank you, David. And lastly, just in case you missed it, we had this incredible uh, two-day Code Rage mobile session. So David was kind enough to post all the replay recordings are available for, for Code Rage Mobile, uh, the sessions and the replays. Uh, if you go to uh, embarcadero.com slash Code Rage, uh, you can take a look at the, uh, the two days of, uh, of Code Rage Mobile sessions. And that was great. There's two ways to, to watch them. Um, again, they're the session and the Q&A conversation that took place at the end of each one. Uh, you can click on the watch on YouTube link, or you can click on the download MP4 link for each session, which will take you to Code Central so you can grab the MP4 file for offline viewing. Excellent. All right, and then to summarize, let me just leave you with these uh, this, these six points. So hopefully you saw using Delphi XE4 for iOS. Uh, it's it's definitely the, the multi-device true native app development suite. Um, it's it's multi-device true native, one code base, one team. You're going to be able to get your apps to market fast. They're going to be much more secure and have greater control. And it's all still using all of the great award-winning solutions. Delphi and Rad Studio has been uh, famous for all, all these years. So it's still used by millions of software developers worldwide and still supported by this very active community of, of software developers, technology partners, and, uh, and component, component vendors. So uh, at this point, let me turn it over for, uh, for, for questions and answers. Okay, Al, we had a few questions come in. I just have to, let me get my interface back up here. Okay. Um, uh, Bruce asked, will the embedded interbase IB Lite be made available for desktop as well as mobile? And the answer there is it's only currently available the IB Lite for, for iOS, but we'll pass along the request to the interbase team and see what they might do. There is a multiple editions of Interbase. There is a desktop edition that, that you can license. The developer edition for testing, of course, you get with the product. The the to-go edition, you get a test deployment license, and then IB Lite for mobile, where you get an unlimited deployment uh, license. When you purchase XE4, you'll get those keys, the XE4 product key, the test deployment key, and the I for uh, Interbase to-go and the IB Lite uh, unlimited deployment key that you can use to put into your apps, as Al showed you. Um, Dave Robinson asked if FireMonkey was only on iOS, and, and also uh, what about Android? And Anders answered that one uh, on my name. FireMonkey currently supports Win32, Win64, Macintosh OS X on Delphi and C++. And then on iOS, currently it's Delphi for iOS, 5.1, 6.0, and it's iPod Touch fourth generation and above, uh, and it works on all the uh, iPhones and iPads that will run 5.1, 6.0, and 6.1, including my old uh, iPhone 3GS. When we moved to iOS 7, Anders, I think Apple announced it's only, what is it, iPhone 4 and above, and I, any iPad? I'm trying to remember what they announced at WWDC. Uh, yeah, that'll be. Um, I think that'll become clear uh, once they actually ship as well. Okay, but I believe so. And Android is later this year for Delphi and C plus um, plus. Bruce asked, "How do we connect to DataSnap servers from .NET?" Uh, and I answered that. And now you're the expert as well in the whole uh, world of uh, DataSnap and .NET and HTML5 and so on. But you can 
You can use yes, I can. I'll, I'll, talk about yes, the mobile. Yes, yeah, connection. it's yeah. a standard. You know, a standard the C sharp REST client call, a data snap REST server with a standard C sharp REST call can connect to that data snap service, and I, uh, I'll I'll send you some examples on how we do that. Yeah, so that's that's using the mobile connector technology. You can use uh, PHP, Delphi, C plus plus, C sharp, Java, BlackBerry, Java, uh, Android and HTML5 builder through PHP, and I think it goes through a curl runtime library or something to do REST calls and do the JSON uh, parsing of the parameter sent in and the result coming back. And Al has videos and code rage sessions, and we have documentation for how you can connect to data snap service via REST across a whole wide range. Al's got videos on BlackBerry and uh, Android as well using Java. Correct, yeah. So for yeah. all, all of those devices, right, BlackBerry, Windows Phone, Android, and, and iOS, we have mobile connectors, which gives you all the helper classes that knows how to connect to the data snap service. It knows about all the methods on the data snap service. It knows how to return uh, those items back to the call and client, as David mentioned, as, as JSON objects JSON. that you can parse yeah. and, uh, and, and use in the device. Well, you can also use JavaScript. So you can, there's a JavaScript. Correct. That is correct. As well. Yeah. So those were the questions that were queued up that we sort of triaged a little bit along the way. If you have other questions, just put them into the Q&A log. And I know, Al, we're a few minutes over, but uh, Anders and I are hanging tight here in Scotts Valley. Excellent. The only other comment maybe I'll make real quick is that, again, don't be confused by other products that do multi-platform, multi-mobile. Uh, in the case of Delphi iOS, it's real native code. One of the demos I show sometimes is a, I set a breakpoint on a button in an iOS application in Delphi, and then I run it in the simulator, and I bring up the CPU view where it shows me Intel code, because that's what the compiler for the simulator uses. Then I change the target to iOS device, and I, and I run the application, click the button on my device. It stops in the, in the source code at the breakpoint. I bring up the CPU viewer, and it's got Android machine code and Android registers, or sorry, ARM, <laughs> that was so stupid, <laughs> ARM <laughs> instructions and ARM registers. I was getting ahead of myself for, for yes, you were. <laughs> but in any case, because we have both the Delphi iOS Intel compiler for the simulator, we also have a Delphi ARM compiler, uh, the debugger and the comp optimizing compiler, it all is native code on each of the platforms that we run on. And the same thing will be the case on platforms in the future as well. All native code. No interpreters, no VMs, no uh, script code, no whatever. And FireMonkey in XE4 is generations ahead of the FireMonkey iOS we shipped way back in XE2, which was a subset of FireMonkey and used the Free Pascal compiler. This, this is uh, the third generation vastly improved and extended with our native code Delphi compiler for iOS. So it's the, it's the real deal. Uh, Anders had a great session at CodeRage Mobile last week. You can check that out where he, we, he shows how to get at other iOS APIs that we haven't wrapped yet. Uh, he's got a, an accepted app in the store. His analog clock, analog clock app, it now has uh, uh, ads. So he's wrapped the iAd call with the help of a community member and in-app purchases. So he's, both of those are accepted. If you search for Fire Monkey in iTunes or uh, Analog Clock, Anders Olson, Delphi, you'll find his clock. And the latest version has has IAD and, uh, and in-app payments, and he's blogged about it on his blog as well. And you see it on your screen now. Very cool. Okay, Bruce, let's see. Uh, even though this is a special virtual tool event, will the plea replay be made available. We're recording, Bruce, the the, the session, and I'll uh, put it up on YouTube uh, as soon as I can. Or you can come back again uh, this evening. I think, Al, you're doing another session at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time? That is correct. Okay. Right, and, and the important point, right, right now we're doing iOS. But when we release Android, everything I did now for iOS, you know, from the same code base, I will simply target Android and, and rebuild and be able to deploy it to Android devices. So 
Uh, you get iOS today, but everything I do right now for iOS, I'm going to be able to reuse for Android once we add Android as a target platform. So that's very exciting. And that code, one last thing on the code, that code is only available to people who attend the webinar, this one and the one later this day. Well, the other thing Anders has as a replay in Code Rage Mobile is he goes through the whole process of creating an app, uploading it, and goes through all the steps of how you submit and put and update and how you get messages back and sometimes terrible rejections from Apple. Uh, he's got a whole session on how to build an app and put it into the store. Let, let me thank you all for attending. Uh, I, I hope you all enjoyed as much as I enjoyed presenting it. And I'm going to leave you with this one last note on, on, on security and control. You know, there's, there's many app development vendors out there enabling this multi-platform development, but they're using these scripting languages and these, and these run times, which are very notorious for, for hacker targets. And they, they present these very inherent security risks on these on these mobile devices with with, with rad studio xe4 you really get these true native apps so your code runs directly on the device you know reducing any risk of any third party attacks so that, that's very important so once again thank you for all attending and uh, have a great day